Alrighty, um, we've just tipped over, so I might jump in. I can still see there's people pouring in, but we might get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Emma Waterford. I am the Deputy CEO and Director of Policy for the Committee for Sydney, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this really exciting and uh, slightly unusual event for us, uh, uh, talking, hearing from the winners of the Public Space Ideas Competition. To start today's event, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to uh, elders, past, present and emerging. And while we're meeting online and you might be in different parts of Sydney or indeed different parts of the world, I'm currently on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people and I pay my respects to them. Today, uh, we're here to hear uh, about the Public Space Ideas Competition that's been run over the last six months, seven, eight months now by now. Um, we had 531 entries to this competition. It was an incredibly popular thing. People are really interested in public space. Uh, from that 531, we uh, narrowed it down to 13 highly commended and eight winners. It was no easy feat, but it was, uh, it was the tough job of our 14 judges to do that. Um, and today we're gonna hear from uh, most of those eight uh, winners, um, which I'm really excited to hear from. Um, but before we jump into that, I wanted to, um, you'll see another face on your screen, Alex O'Mara. Alex is the um, Group Deputy Secretary for Place, Design and Public Spaces within the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, and was our partner on this project. The committee and DPI were working together on this piece in, with support from ACOM, the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects and the Sydney Morning Herald. So I just wanted to throw to Alex and say, hey, Alex, um, this was an amazing experience, wasn't it? What are your thoughts? Uh, fantastic, Eamon. Um, I think we were just so thrilled with the quality of the entries we got um, and with the level of interest and discussion around public space. And I wanted to begin by acknowledging that I'm a long and pay my respects to Elvis um, and, um, and to any Aboriginal people with us today. Um, look, we were just over 500 entries, so thrilled and so thrilled to get such a range of kind of um, insights about how we can improve our public space from kids, from industry, from you know, people in the community. Um, and I think really a testimony to how valuable and important public space is to the community. Um, and we've seen with COVID, I think, um, people really valuing their public spaces like ever before because their access is being restricted. And I think, you know, in lockdown, we all thought about how important it is um, that we find time to be with, um, with other people in our public spaces, that sense of community. Um, and so we really taken the opportunity to engage broadly about public space. And I think what we saw here was people's ability to dream big. So as I said, so delighted to see the breadth of entries um, so many great ideas and I particularly wanted to thank the Committee for Sydney for leading such a brilliant program, um, to thank our industry partner ACOM, um, the Institute of Architects, a special thank you to you Eamon who, um, you know, you've really led um, this in such a passionate way and I think we're really grateful for that sense of partnership and collaboration and those things so important to great public space. Um, and also for me, a huge thank you to everybody who put in um, an entry. Um, we hope the competition will be a great sort of spark for conversations and new ideas and in innovation across industry, government, councils, community, business. Um, what we know from the community is people want us to make our public spaces work harder for them. That they want them to be more vibrant, more connected, more successful, more enjoyable, more activated. And that's such a great shared aspiration to have. Um, and I suppose I just reflect that the competition was the first project for our inaugural Festival of Place. Um, and that festival is about us all celebrating the breadth and possibility and beauty of our public spaces through a year long rolling program that highlights the beauty and importance of our great public spaces. So it's a festival that's really about celebrating our connection to place every day. And if you haven't been onto the website, I'd encourage you to have a look. There's lots of free stuff there, videos, beautiful videos with Sydney Dance Company dancing in some of our iconic public spaces and a summer night walk podcast series with Tim Ross. Um, and it's all really um, about our premier's priority to increase walkable access to quality public space across our urban areas in New South Wales. Um, you know, and I think what's most important from us is that's a civic led voice that we hear from you about what public space you think is important, what you'd like to see us do better, um, how we can make more better and activated public spaces 
your voices have had a great impact already and we're really keen to look at ways that we can bring some of these ideas to life. You might have seen in the budget this week a bit of money announced for us to actually put into, well, build on, actually uh, deliver some of these ideas. So we're working with Place Making New South Wales to, to do that. Um, and just finally, um, thank you to the judging panel, huge effort from them. And congratulations to the winners. Um, I'm really excited to hear from them personally about you know, what they were thinking about and, and how they come up with these ideas. And um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you again. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, and I echo all of those. It's very exciting to see that money in the budget. Um, it's been a dream working with the department on this. Um, Alex is still there. I know she's, 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 her, her video is gone, but she's still there. Um, you, can, you can turn your camera off, it's all right. It's just a bit daunting seeing my face in such massive size. Um, so today's event's gonna be a little, little bit different to a normal Community Sydney event. We have set a challenge for our speakers um, based on this concept called Pecha Kucha or Pachakacha. Um, there's a bit of a difference of opinion in the office about how you pronounce it. But essentially what it is, is to do a presentation with just 20 slides and 20 seconds for each of those slides. I'm running the slide deck for the most part um, and those slides will progress uh, automatically. So uh, the challenge is on for our speakers to basically stick to their time. There's no capacity for them to go over time, which is uh, a, an interesting and novel challenge that we're going to try out today and see how it works. Um, to that end, all of our participants, all of our um, speakers are online. They're just hiding their videos. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw to our first speaker, um, but uh, who who is Georgina? Hello, Georgina. How are you? Hi, everyone. Hi, Amy. Um, so Georgina, you're going to share your slides because yours is um, full of some fancy animations that don't quite uh, that, that, that gum up my computer. So why don't you share your slides now? And what we're going to do is we're going to go through um, our, our eight presentations, one after another, rapid fire. Um, for those in the audience, if you've got questions for our speakers, please feel free to type them in. And if and when we've got time between presentations, I'll throw some rapid fire questions at our speakers. But with, with no further ado, let's jump in. Georgina, over to you. Sure, thank you. The story of my street is a park starts with Aisha. Aisha and her family bought a townhouse in a triple occupancy development in Fairfield Heights a year ago. Fairfield Heights is a middle ring suburb in the Western Growth Corridor of Sydney. Their place is in the block near Fairfield Heights shops on Beamer Street near the juncture of Montague Street. Aisha and her family bought into the area for a few reasons. There'll be significant population growth across the West in the next 40 years, driving infill development of low apartments or townhouses, which means it's affordable. Also, it's multicultural. There's a large community of Iraqis, which is Aisha's family background. Aisha learned that there are only a few parks within 10 minutes walk. Also last summer, it reached 47 degrees, making it impossible to walk to the shops as there is only 14% canopy cover along the way. Aisha was pleased to be invited to a community event to discuss a potential Living Streets initiative in her area. Council explained that a living street uses living systems to deliver social, environmental and economic benefits to its community. Some of the potential benefits were improved physical health. You want to walk places as it's cool and attractive. You might get to know your neighbours more and the value of houses on a tree-lined street can improve and energy bills decrease. They talked about success factors. These were the levers that can be pulled to maximise the benefits. First, were ways to reclaim and reallocate space for multi-uses, like closing a road to create a pocket park. Then giving living systems what they need to thrive, like plant diversity for animals, deep soil and water for trees. Then existing infrastructure or policy that can hinder or help deliver the benefits, such as offsets, power lines and driveways. Then finally, levers to create an environment that encourages people to use the street for more than driving and parking. They looked at the area's opportunities and constraints. The street is 15.4 metres wide, which determines how many trees are possible. A strong street grid might enable some streets to be closed to create pocket parks. Existing driveways, parking and power lines impact on where things can be placed and water moves down Montague Street and can be used to support plantings. Aisha's group discussed a vision for the project and principles they'd like to see in a pilot. They hope that streets in our neighbourhood become cool green parks that bring our community together for different community ownership, a good life in 20 minutes, 
environmentally friendly living, multi-use shared spaces and biodiverse water sensitive design. They then talked about how they might approach the project through scenarios. First looking at business as usual, then reclaiming the verge, then reclaiming the street, then reimagining the street, and then reimagining the neighbourhood. They showed a photo of Aisha Street looking east towards the shops. A top-down view showed only 4% of the street was covered um, by shade, a 14% continuous canopy cover. 86% of the time, Aisha could be in up to 47 degree heat, and with climate change, that could be 49 degrees. They discussed what was happening to areas when an existing block was redeveloped into a townhouse. If the past was a predictor of the future, it meant more large driveways, which impacted on greening opportunities. They would see more grey, less green, more heat, and less ability to walk places if they kept on the same path. The first scenario planted mixed species trees in public land to support the largest species possible to cast the most shade. High habitat value plants and herb gardens under trees, water to trees through a tessellated curve, reduction in speed from 40 to 30. Aisha felt relieved to know with relatively small action shade could improve from 4 to 19 per cent. The next scenario builds on the one before plus additional street trees planted in blisters, speed reduced from 30 to 20 and permeable public footpaths. On private land, trees of up to 12 metres at the interface with public land to provide additional shade. New and existing properties encouraged to use permeable driveway treatments. This next scenario assumes that the street has been redeveloped into townhouses, power lines put underground, Beamer Street closed at Montague Street and a pocket park created at the spot. The speed would drop to 10 kilometres per hour. Residents would be supported to develop multi-use front gardens with barbecues and front fences replaced with planting. Another assumption in this scenario was that the street had adopted shared driveways. They explained why this was critical. It allowed a more even distribution of large street trees, which reduced the need for blisters, which meant more on-street parking and space for large trees in front yards. The last site scenario zoomed out to the neighbourhood. It considered what streets might be suitable for reclaiming the verge and which should be invested in to reimagine the street. It applied the three scenarios across the area to develop a connected green suburb. They got the group to imagine they were walking along Beamer Street. First, they would come to the Montague Pocket Park. Then they would walk under full green cover to Stanley Street, which had been rewilded. And then onto the Ann Street Pocket Park. And finally to the green shopping strip. The conclusion stated the obvious, that residential streets can be a place for people and the environment, as well as cars and services. They talked about the funding mix that was needed, developer contributions, council rates, state government grants recouped by value capture, alongside rate rebates, parks foundations and corporate partnerships. The first step was a pilot and Beamer Street was it. Learning from this would inform a living neighbourhoods master plan for the area and a guide that could help other councils. Council explained that the development of the plan would be led by a mix of success indicators, such as continuous canopy cover, shade, biodiversity, open space per person, alongside pedestrian safety and parking. Aisha felt purposeful. She could imagine her children's children playing under the shade of a large tree in her new Montague Street pocket park, running wild in the wilderness on Stanley Street and having a picnic in the Ann Street pocket park. Her first job was to buy a large tree for the front yard. Thank you. Sorry, I'm clearly muted. One, as, as I was saying, one of the key challenges of this all moving so quickly is I wasn't even ready to jump back on. That's wonderful. It's such a great idea, Georgia. I really, really love this one. It's it's um, it's such a such a sort of important conversation that we need to be having. You know, this this shift away from from private vehicles to public public space. Um, so congratulations on that one. I've actually um, been furiously scribbling my notes and, and, and doing some sums and realized we don't actually have a lot of time for Q&A. We're gonna have to keep going because um, six and a half minutes per presentation actually gets us all the way to the, to the end of the event. So what I'm gonna do is say thank you and we're gonna jump to the next one if that's all right. Um, so for our next 
uh, presentation, I'm going to share my screen um, and then uh, throw that up. Let me just manage that. And then I'm going to invite our, uh, there we go. I'm going to invite um, Bianca and Molly to join me. Um, hey guys. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Good, thank you. So, so Bianca and Molly are the winner of our uh, Children and Young People's Award. Um, they're actually also the winner of our People's Choice Award, which we're announcing today. Um, the voting closed today for that with an incredible 18,000 votes placed uh, on this program. Well done. These guys were the winners of that. They didn't get all 18,000 votes, but they did get about 7,000 of them. So either you guys have an incredibly um, powerful social media, uh, you know, <laughs> ability to run a social media campaign, or people really resonated with this idea. You know, I think it's such a wonderful one. So congratulations, guys, on being the people's choice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, jump to your first slide and then, and then it's over to you to get started. Um, yep. To you. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Bianca Hales. And my name is Molly Flanagan. And we are Year 10 students from Meriden School in Strathfield. Today we are presenting our idea, A Bushland Experience. Initially, we were inspired to do this project after completing our school assessment task to design a rooftop garden where we realised how much fun it would be to design a landscape. On this next slide, <laughs> you can see our final designs from this project. We enjoyed finding sustainable options and making aesthetic decisions and we wanted to apply what we had learnt. So before beginning this project, we were really saddened at the poor conditions of pre-existing national parks and publicly accessible bushland areas. Often these places included minimal aesthetic or environmental decisions. For example, we noticed the reoccurrence of concrete flooring and randomly placed seating, as seen in the images on the following slide. Furthermore, in recent years, the environmental and social benefits of national parks and publicly accessible bushland areas have been undermined as the funding and investments towards them is reduced in favour of other interests and investments. The underlying issue is, there, is that there is a lack of appreciation for public spaces, such as publicly accessible bushland, and we wanted to change this. However, bushland is extremely important in building resilience to climate change and conserving native biodiversity. Beyond their environmental benefits, these spaces have significant social, cultural and economic benefits. They bring people together, provide jobs, and often hold significant spiritual significance to the traditional owners of the land. Publicly accessible bush spaces, made effectively, can be sanctuaries from bustling modern life like we all experience today. Stress levels in Australia have increased by at least 12% in the last six years, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. However, research has shown that contact with the natural environment has positive psychological effects, including reducing stress. When developing our idea and our design, I personally was inspired by Wangle Park in Croydon. This place is composed of a beautiful wetland and spacious fields. The space uses the organic fluid lines to encourage people to move around and uses environmentally friendly materials. Through this space, I saw how making conscious aesthetic and environmental decisions would make a space more inviting. I was inspired by Putney Park, a space which immerses people into the surrounding land through small pool areas around the playground, encouraging children to play. I observed how this space was welcoming of people of all ages by a beautiful and engaging concept. Through these places, we observed how they used conscious environmental and aesthetic decisions to encourage an appreciation for public spaces such as these. We wanted to use our idea to encourage people to reconsider the value of a public bushland by using aesthetic and environmental considerations that we didn't see included in other designs. Our design aims to accommodate for everyone. With bike and wheelchair accessible paths, we included a water circuit around poles to engage children in a sensory experience. Our design also creates an immersive environment with a curving path to direct attention to the surrounding bush. The small lake creates a focal point in the centre, which reinforces the water theme. The raised garden beds around the design enclose the space. We wanted our idea to build a sense of community that we spoke of, with a series of communal areas interconnected by the raised garden beds, the curving path, and additionally, the flow of water throughout the design. 
In our design, this walk water circuit extends around the poles in the children area. We hoped this idea would engage them with the sensory experience to develop a connection for the environment and encourage an appreciation for the environment. When developing our design, we also included an irrigation system. We wanted this to spread along the gardens and water the plants. We were hoping that this system would directly water the plants. This would ensure that water is lost and the cool air temperature and the surrounding environment is decreased by a lot based on our research. Additionally, we identified a selection of native plants. We knew that this would encourage biodiversity and resilience to climate change and embrace the local climate of our beautiful country, Australia, as well as reducing the maintenance required overall. The overhead gum trees that we included, such as brush box or even maybe snow gum, provide a cool canopy to combat the heat island effect of, the, of Sydney city and many other urban cities in Australia. We placed deciduous trees in the garden to maximise shade in the summer and warmth in the winter. The transition of colour would also be an interesting aesthetic feature. The raised garden beds include hedging to block out outside noise. Along with the raised garden beds, we imagined that plants such as brown baronia would be included to create a calming scent. In our design, we made important note to include raw materials around the space in various areas such as seating and playing. This would ensure that it is as naturally immersive as possible. We wanted our design to be immersive and also keep in contact with the natural environment. So, for example, our wooden table and chairs were used alongside sandstone features. We wanted all these new raw and natural materials to be recycled and ensure sustainability and accommodate the environment. Ultimately, our idea uses conscious environmental and aesthetic decisions to encourage more people within Sydney to appreciate public spaces like these. We hoped that through our design, we would reinforce the value of public spaces as a significant part of our community, knowing its social, cultural and economic benefits. And we hope that this would have so many other benefits as well. Thank, Thank you, you for so listening to our idea, a bushland, bushland experience. experience. Thank you. I think our slide was continued because we were going a bit too fast. <laughs> no, guys, it's fine. I'm just going to let them roll through. People can, <laughs> can, can immerse themselves and appreciate it. Well done. That was that was phenomenal. I mean, any, any landscape design firms that are on the line, um, I think, you know, if you're looking for some summer interns, um, the project managers, maybe, these guys probably <laughs> need to roll into that. Um, look, you know, there's, it's, it's easy to see why you've won the public, the people's choice vote. This is a phenomenal idea and I, and I think you know, we were really impressed by it. So thank you guys, well done. Yep. Um, that may be your last, is that your last slide? Oh, there we go. That's the, that's the beautiful ultimate uh, vision okay, of the... Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you, that's, that's wonderful. Congratulations, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, there we go, thank you for listening. Um, so what we might do is we might jump jump to the next one and keep yep. going. Um, for this one, I'm going to um, ask the walking volunteers to join me. Uh, g'day, Paul. I think you're going to be taking the lead for your team. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Eamon. Okay. Well, you were you were the winner of the best temporary and or low cost idea um, for 30k speed limits for non arterial roads. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to your first slide. Your timer starts, and it's over to you. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, everyone. Now, we've just got the, uh, the first opening slide. Maybe you could jump to the next one. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. We can all imagine times when slowing down improves our lives, helping us to live in the present, to be more relaxed and more efficient. And similar advantages occur when we slow our streets reclaiming the public space that is currently dominated by speed. Cities were not always obsessed with speed. Until the early 20th century, the street was seen as a public space for people of all ages. I think we've, um, we need to go to the next slide, Eamon. Cities were not always obsessed with speed until the early 20th century. The street was seen as a public space for people of all ages and the freedom and safety of people walking and cycling and socialising on streets was an accepted part of city life. From the 1920s, speed was seen as part of the new age that would provide advantages for us all. 
But instead of improving our lives, speed has led to tragic road crash deaths, huge infrastructure costs, and the loss of public space in the city. Policymakers are now realising that speed is a serious problem, not a solution, and that 30k speed limits effectively address this problem, making our roads safer and providing benefits for social connection, local economies, neighbourhood amenity and sustainability. In 1992, Graz in Austria was first to introduce 30k for an entire city. The new limits soon had majority support. Livability improved with calmer streets and less pollution. Road users showed greater consideration for others and serious crashes fell by a quarter. 30k streets are now widespread in Europe. The Netherlands has over 75% of its urban streets at 30k or less. In Berlin and Munich, it's over 80%. Several European cities have plans to lower speeds in almost all residential areas. Cities throughout the world are discovering the benefits of 30k or 20 mile an hour streets. Portland in the United States has a citywide limit of 20 miles per hour in residential streets as part of its Vision Zero strategy, aiming for zero road deaths. 30 kilometre hour speeds are a major part of the success of Vision Zero in cities like Oslo and Helsinki. Impressively, neither city had a single pedestrian fatality in 2019. So why is reducing speed so important for road safety? One reason why road crashes decline when speeds are reduced is drivers have a wider cone of vision and see the street as a public space for people, not just as a movement corridor. At lower speeds, drivers are more able to respond to unanticipated movements. At 30 kilometres an hour, a driver can stop within 13 metres. At 50k, you need twice that distance. A driver who could stop from 30 kilometres an hour in front of pedestrians would hit them at 50 if driving at 50 kilometres an hour, likely resulting in a fatality. Humans have evolved over many thousands of years to survive running into a solid object at maximum running speed or about 30 kilometres an hour. Less than 10% of pedestrians die when struck by a vehicle travelling at 30, but fatality rates rise sharply at speeds over 30. As well as being safer, low speed streets look and feel safer for vulnerable road users. In nations with low speed streets, parents are much more likely to let their children use their streets to walk or cycle to school than in nations with higher speed limits. When children are not free to safely use their streets, this creates more traffic congestion as parents feel obliged to take on chauffeuring duties. This extra traffic and chauffeuring consumes much more time than the few seconds longer driving at 30 kilometres an hour in local streets would take. 30k streets not only encourage active transport, promoting physical activity and combating obesity, they also encourage social connection. This creates local stronger local communities, increasing social capital, and promoting both physical and mental health. Another health issue is noise. Traffic noise ranks second after air pollution as an environmental threat to public health. Slower streets are much quieter and more relaxing than streets with fast moving traffic, creating spaces that encourage people to convene, linger, socialize, and of course, to shop. Local economies benefit from lower speed streets, which are attractive to local people, so they spend more time there. An important effect is that they spend more money in local shops and services, instead of driving to more distant shopping centres. City budgets benefit 
through lower infrastructure costs. With 30k streets, we don't need to install expensive separated bike lanes as cyclists comfortably share the street. 30k streets can be, can be implemented in non-arterial roads throughout the city, and this can be done very quickly. COVID-19 has stimulated rapid low-cost interventions in cities throughout the world. In 30k streets, car parking space can be safely converted into space for people, providing a subtle way of reducing our dependence on cars. As Rodney Tolley and I explain in our recent book, car dependence is the definitive wicked problem for policymakers. Tackling this is hard and needs win-win strategies. Low-speed streets tick multiple boxes for health, sustainability and economic resilience. If we want to create an even more livable Sydney, slowing streets to 30 kilometres an hour will provide a circuit breaker to refocus on living and enjoying places rather than rushing and movement. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I, this is such a wonderful idea that's so applicable, you know, as you say, in every non-arterial road around the entire city. Um, this, is a, this is a campaign that the committee is really passionate about and something that we've um, been embedding in a whole bunch of work we've been doing around uh, reclaiming high streets, around making the city more cyclable, uh, around thinking about um, how we how we make the city more walkable. You know, clearly 30 kilometres an hour has so many benefits beyond um, you know the obvious around around slow, slowing our lives down. It's 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 just a wonderful idea with with so many sort of overlapping benefits. I think it's a it's a no brainer. So well done. Thank you for your your thoughts on this. I might actually just if it's all right, just jump back to your to your book so that I can check the name of it to anybody that's that's keen to know more about this. It sounds like that book's a good place to start. Am I right? I would think so. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Ian and Rodney as well. Um, look, we, we didn't really get to talk about it, but as the walking volunteers, you guys do really wonderful work. You know, we've, we, we, we know you well from the work you did around the Manly to Bondi Walk and, and many other great pieces of advocacy. So well done to your, your thinking and your passion and your advocacy in this space. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to jump to Janelle and Gracie. Um, these were the winner of, of our student award, which goes to a tertiary education student. Hey guys, how are you going? Hi, good, thank you. Now this might be the, the one of the prettiest slide decks I've seen. Um, so uh, well done on that. But aside from that, the content is bloody excellent. So I'm going to, uh, same deal as everybody else, I'm going to hand over to you, pass to the next slide, and then your timer starts and you're on. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Janelle and this is Gracie and our project is titled Common Utilities. I'm so sorry, I bumped my mouse, please. Uh, That's go. okay, you can go <laughs> next slide now. Okay. <laughs> um, as a proposal for a council-led and state-coordinated initiative, Common Utilities seeks to reimagine the civic potential of Sydney's power, water, sewerage and telecom infrastructure. Rather than private development geared towards market forces, this reimagination seeks to preserve these places in public trust. <laughs> Utility infrastructure often occupies historic, strategic and contextually significant sites within our cities. As anchors of density and transportation, the obsolescence of these sites is untenable and unsustainable. Rather, they must be revisited in order to solicit greater value for the communities they service. Uh, could you go next slide? Sorry, I think it's a bit behind. Thank you. Our civic ambitions should not be founded on a blank slate approach, but should instead seek the transformation of existing infrastructure to renew our supply of community spaces that promote joy, social inclusion, and collective culture for our ever-densifying urban fabric. These facilities would represent nodes of a single communal and cultural organism, demonstrating exemplary standards in design, creativity, and sustainability. <clears throat> 
The proposal aims to celebrate the city's collective urban memory and preserve its stories for future generations and future uses. The proposal advocates for state government coordination of land acquisition and funding. Individual projects would then be led by local councils to ensure that sites are redeveloped alongside community groups, indigenous consultation, and then run through local design competitions. Competitive and open design processes led by local governments are proven to boost the creative and physical standards of urban landscapes. Successful precedent initiatives include an open ideas call out from Melbourne Water Land, the community driven public space program Shape Newham in London, and mid century housing estate projects by the City of London. These utility sites occupy a diverse range of neighbourhoods, geographies, and scales varying from the urban, suburban to industrial. They form unique products of history and locale. It is essential that any future adaptation responds to this sense of place and the emergent needs of surrounding communities. One such site of high cultural significance and future possibility is the Ride Pump House. Located adjacent to West Ride Station, the project was completed in 1921 and remains one of the largest and longest operating water utilities in Sydney. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Beginning as a steam powered water station, the pump house delivered water from Potts Hill to a container at Ride, serving Sydney's northern distribution system until 1930. Containing historic elements, the site hosts a reservoir, an elevated railway, and a grand factory. Possibilities for transformation include a railway park inspired by the Highland, sporting facilities, and a large-scale arts foundation. Innovative industrial conversion models also include the London Tate Modern and the local Kusula Powerhouse. We believe that this site holds the ability to not only showcase the important stories of Ride's industrial past, but also supply a new cultural icon for central Sydney region, a suburban area currently experiencing what some of the largest population increases in Sydney. This is a product of the Future Metro project. Uh, many opportunities also exist at a smaller urban scale in the form of substations and micro pump houses. And one such example is the Taylor Square substation and amenities completed in 1907. And this is the oldest surviving underground public toilet as well as the first female public toilets provided in Sydney. Designed in a fine Edwardian brick style, this small structure has defined the identity of Taylor Square for generations. It has also provided a constant setting to in developments of national significance as the symbolic birthplace of gay pride activism in Australia since so the first pride march commenced from Taylor Square in 1978. In recent years, the building has also hosted temporary art shows as part of a short-term activation program by the City of Sydney. This could also develop into a small art space run alongside NAS and emerging artists fostering a creative dialogue between the art school, community, and council. In addition to the development of the site as a venue for artistic intervention, a permanent kiosk and cafe could be installed, supporting the art program and activating life within the leafy square. This would assist the site's transition from a place of movement to one of rest and quiet observation of the surrounding city. Finally, the Sydney water, uh, stormwater pit represents an industrial site with potential to be better integrated in the surrounding city as the area becomes increasingly residential. Completed in 1941, the project was built in response to increasing urban expansion in an area prone to flooding. The construction of the basin was also part of the government's unemployment relief scheme, which provided critical jobs and income during the Great Depression. Over a brick structure, the basin itself was lined in sparrow pecked ashlar sandstone, whilst the pumping station rests on a dramatic series of fins at the site's edge.
Today, the pit and pump house remain as landmarks of Sydney's industrial landscape, particularly when viewed from the railway, which has been decorated by a local graffiti artist. Catalyzed by the new metro station and future densities, there is an urgent need for increases in green and recreational space within the area. The pit could be reimagined as a green meeting place for the new neighborhood, supporting a local growing population with the existing character of the light industry within the area. Rewilding the inner city and introducing a water-inspired landscape could support emergent community needs supplying a central and cooling green heart to the neighborhood. And finally, when brought together through a unified vision, architecture, art, landscape, and urbanism become complementary ways of forming the city. Common Utilities offers a long-term perspective for Sydney's cultural future, part curiosity, part exploration, and part real world problem solving. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. There's a couple of comments coming through on the on the on the Q and A button. Comment, uh, commending you for the beautiful graphics in this in this. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love this. I mean, I think you know all of these locations are sort of intrinsically kind of familiar to people. You know, even if they don't know the specific Sydney drainage pit, they know places like this, and they know you know the amazing opportunity that this that this um, provides for us. And I did not know that the Taylor Square substation was the first female toilet. It's, it's uh, an interesting tidbit of history. Um, so thank you for this. Look, I think also obviously very pertinent to come out today when there's, there's a, a re-emergent debate around the future of the White Bay Power Station that's, that's kicked off overnight. Um, you know, I think the, the opportunity presented by adaptive reuse of these, some of these places is, is, is one that we need to think very carefully. So thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Gracie. Again, another pair that if you're looking for a, um, uh, some interns or, or, you know, next project managers for your next big major. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you for it. Thanks, guys. We're going to jump to the next one. Uh, this is uh, Cred Consulting. Um, we've got a bunch of the, the Cred team uh, online, I think, all joining us from slightly different locations. So um, who, have, who have we got? Are you guys here? Yes, we are. Hi, I Eamon. Mean, it's Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. How are you going? Good. We've got Lisa, I think. She's probably down the list somewhere. But I'm going to present, so we're all good okay. to go. Well, you're on. You're ready to roll. You know the deal. You are the, the congratulations on being the winner of the best open space idea, Thank by you. the way. I have to say, I mean, obviously open space is an area that people have big thoughts about. This was this was our um highest nominated category. So it was the most competitive space. Wow. Well, well done to you on. Thanks. Um, and Ethan, I mean, can, you, can you skip past the, the cover slide? Because I don't have anything to say to that one. Absolutely. Oh, really? <laughs> this, is, this is so... Okay. You're on. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So this is an actual park in Blacktown. Um, and as you can see, there's not a lot you can do there. Not even walk your donkey by the looks of it, or light a fire or play golf. Um, and across, across Sydney, there are many, many open space areas like this one laying dormant and unused. They only have one street frontage with houses and back fences overlooking them. They're nothing more than mowed lawns that can't be used at all. And in 2020, we know that lawns occupy around 70% of green spaces in our cities. I'm a fast talker, so this is gonna be fun. Let, let me stick to 20 seconds a slide. Um, so, in some suburbs of Western Sydney, um, up to around 50% of local parks or open spaces have only one street frontage. And you can see from this graphic here that that means that only, it's only one place that you can enter that park, which doesn't really make it publicly accessible or publicly usable. Um, and, and these lawns have laid dormant and have been put in the too hard basket by a lot of councils. They can't be used for locating recreational facilities like playgrounds or courts, even though they're in huge demand, um, because they might be too noisy for the homes that overlook them. Sometimes they just end up being rubbish dumps, as you can see in this photo. They aren't used as parks by residents um, because they pr pretty much have absolutely no amenity. They are just old green spaces with grey back fences, and they don't really do a lot to make our neighbourhoods look more beautiful. Even though we know for engagement with communities across all of New South Wales that beauty and colour are a really high priority for people in their neighbourhoods. Even though they offer little benefit, they cost local government a lot to maintain each year. 
um, eating up declining budgets to maintain and deliver quality public space. The cost to council, a lot to mow, and apparently it's very exhausting to mow as well, um, to clear of dumped rubbish and to monitor antisocial behaviour. Given the assumption that almost 70% of the population will live in cities by 2050, careful integration of nature into our urban public spaces is really, really important for us, our health and mental well-being, and for the animals and insects who will share our, un, our urbanized areas. Open space is not just for us. So one solution that we've come up with, which is gaining support across the world, is reimagining and rewilding these high cost, low benefit lawns as urban micro meadows. They can transform, uh, transform small areas of lawn into a celebration of native plant species, biological diversity, habitats for birds and insects, and environmental health and well-being. Micro meadows support biodiversity with many beneficial trickle-down effects. The variety in plant types provide habitat for birds and insects, including pollinators, which is really important. The presence of tall grasses or flower meadows in areas transformed by human activity contributes to the creation of new habitats and increase in the diversity of plants and animals. Um, they're attractive to small vertebrates, birds and insects. They save water by acting as water retainers and reducing associated mowing and watering costs of urban lawns. And we know that saving our water is a really, really high priority across all of our suburbs and in our increasingly, increasingly hot western suburbs. Um, the cost of intensive grass trimming is really, really high over the long term and much, much more affordable if we have urban meadows instead. Micro meadows make our places more beautiful and in turn our communities and us happier and healthier. We've consulted with thousands of Sydney residents and they really do tell us that colour, nature, beauty is the highest priority, particularly in um, older suburbs out in Western Sydney and in new areas where there isn't really a lot of colour and greenery being, um, being built. Micro meadows reduce emissions, flower meadows work as great anti-smog devices and with no mowing required reduce emissions as well. And research tells us that a square meter of properly selected mixture of meadow plants is able to retain from five to 11 grams of suspended dust. That, that's about the equivalent of five year old tree. So that's pretty good news. Micro meadows build community capacity by connecting neighbors and providing opportunities for community management and educating us on nature. So including micro meadows in urban landscape planning and management processes is an expression of respect for nature at the government level as well. It's telling our communities that we believe in nature and we're giving communities some control over the management of them. So finally, micro meadows can happen right now. This is the best news. They're low cost to introduce and to maintain. There's plenty of sites where the change could happen, so many of them, and we can deliver more great public spaces across our city, lighter, quicker, cheaper, for the good of us all and for the longer term. That's it. Thanks, Sarah. That was that was pretty pretty well timed. That was well done. <laughs> um, was well done. Sorry, I've jumped back to your last one. Look, I, I I mean, you know, I know I'm passing commentary on all of these, but I love this one as well. I mean, I think what really speaks to me about this is also the equity question around, you know, so many of those terribly designed public spaces, particularly in the big public housing estates in Western Sydney. You know, these are these are areas of low socioeconomic um uh, communities that really have yeah. poor quality public spaces available to them. So I really love this idea of starting yeah. in place. That's great. And that, that case study actually does have a lot of social housing backing onto it as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 know, I know this estate well. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> housing right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So congrats, guys. It's really Thank wonderful. You. Um, Tom, you, you, you have jumped on correctly. Um, oh. Well done. To, uh, Tom is uh, one of the one of the people from Robert Stay who was involved in this program, the, uh, th this idea that unlocking South Sydney's newest blue green grid. Now, I have to declare a, 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 an interest. I'm currently uh, sitting in my bedroom in Torella, which is on this map. Um, so I'm especially excited about this idea because, you know, uh, the, the, the self-interest uh, level. Um, so look, Tom, over to you. Um, you know the drill. I'm going to pass to you. Each of your slides has got 20 seconds. I, I think there's only nine slides in your prezzo, but um, we will have it. We can have a bit of a chat afterwards. But uh, yep. I'll press go, and you ready to roll? Yep. Thank you. Um, you can actually skip this slide, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, as uh, also our director Stephen Moore, he's actually from Torella, so we've got a bit of a passion for the the, the, um, the South Sydney suburbs in our office. Um, but yeah, so thanks everyone. I'm representing Hatch Roberts Day. 
Um, we see an incredible opportunity to rethink South Sydney's water catchments to unlock 42 kilometres of continuous walking and cycling trails, linking the inner western suburbs and South Sydney communities with the city um, and of course our beautiful coastline. So Botany Bay, Walleye Creek and Cooks River often get a bit of a bad rap, um, but really some of these, these are some of our city's most underrated places. Um, natural gems surrounded by historic, characterful neighbourhoods um, and on the doorstep to over a million residents. You can probably skip the slide, Amen. Um, so Sydney's become renowned for its natural walks. Uh, each year, Bondi to Coogee, for example, um, attracts millions of visitors. Um, you know, it's got its stunning ocean views, surf culture, cafes, and, you know, major events like sculptures by the sea. But it's also got more nuanced elements, um, you know, beautiful art deco architecture, photogenic surf life-saving clubs, that sort of thing, which really help to portray Sydney's physical and cultural identity to the world. But our green networks do a lot more than just create an experience for visitors. They connect people with nature, they connect communities with each other, and they make us healthier, uh, provide habitat for flora and fauna, and they help to cool our city, making it a more resilient and equitable place. Uh, this slide hasn't worked properly, but that's okay. Um, our studio, as I said, has a bit of a love for the South, um, for South Sydney and the inner West as well. And we saw an opportunity to um, really reveal its true potential by connecting existing movement, existing movement networks with activated green spaces, which become destinations in their own right. And in doing so, neighbourhoods become connected to the city and the sea through this new blue green grid. So a district wide cycleway network will activate waterfronts where water based micro mobility will revolutionise the blue network. The ribbon of new public spaces will reorient existing neighbourhoods to the water's edge, informing the creation of a variety of networks and destinations um, which will unlock access to those places that are really at the heart of our innovation economy. So the proposal opens the, the door to precinct scale opportunities that reimagine a series of waterfront, water oriented, sustainably connected, green urban villages. Um, the potential for this idea is not simply about creating environmental resilience, but also improving access across the city um, which improves its social resilience. I think we're just caught on that slide. You might have to click through. Yep. So uh, yeah, that's basically it. Thanks so much for your time, everyone. Um, just want to say a big thank you to Eamon and the team, Alex and Acom, uh, for putting on this project. It's been a lot of fun for us in the office and it's a really important piece of work. And congratulations to all of the other winners as well. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, this is such a wonderful idea. I mean, I was work, walking along um, while I creek just earlier today, and it is, you know, it used to be a creek that people could walk along, and now nowadays it's it's pretty grimy. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it for fun. Um, but at the same time, you know, recognizing the integration between Walleye Creek and the Cooks River, which obviously is a little bit wider, but then you've, you've got these amazing market gardens down towards Kemar, towards the the um, the the uh, isthmus of the river out, out next to the the airport, you know, there's an incredible opportunity of green space connectivity and, and then feeding back up along uh, beside the airport to the to the city. So this is such a great idea. And, you know, I think um, uh, one that I'm personally going to be advocating for. So thanks for your ideas, because I'm going to run with it. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Tom. All right. Well, we'll jump to our last presentation, which is um, the team from Arab. Hey, Lydia. Hey, Glenda. Um, uh, this, this was the winner of the Minister's Award. Um, so unlike our other uh, awards that were selected by a jury, this one was just picked by one person. Um, we gave the Minister uh, all of the options of, uh, to choose from. Um, and uh, this was the one he picked. So congrats, guys. It's, it's, it's a nice little honour that uh, the Minister thought of this one as his favourite idea. Um, so, you know the drill. We're going to jump straight in. I'm going to pass over to you. You are ready to roll. We are. You can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we wanted to find a place with maximum opportunity to provide benefits to the local community. 
At IWAP, we are lucky to have a wealth of disciplines to draw from. And as a group of dis designers, planners, and engineers, we brainstormed a lot of possible Sydney locations before shortlisting and then voting on our submitted site, the Prospect Water Pipeline Corridor. It's a seven kilometer long stretch of corridor, the same length as some of these iconic public space connections in Sydney. It's located in Western Sydney, about five kilometers southeast of the Prospect Reservoir, where open spaces are sparse and poorly connected to a wider network. The corridor contains three Sydney water pipes that form a critical part of Sydney's water supply infrastructure. I think, can we move to the next slide, please? So these are the three pipes and they are like the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the water network supplying drinking water to about two million Sydney siders today. So this is the existing context of the site. It's largely a residential area and it's also got some industri light industrial areas. This Guildford station and local centre is nearby and there are also many significant urban waterways that exist in the vicinity of the corridor. But there is one big challenge about this corridor and that's that it's a 40 meter wide corridor that is currently fenced off, can cont contain the pipes and strips of grassland and it, it, and it is inaccessible to the public and it segregates communities, the residential communities on each side of the pipeline. But there are huge opportunities, we see huge opportunities in this corridor. It, and the, the main one is providing a key connection for the community to improve access to schools, to the station, to the shops, and linking together the pockets of parks and reserves that exist in this area to improve recreation and biodiversity value of all these community places. Another big opportunity is that there's considerable placemaking and activation that can happen through increasing tree planting and canopy cover building in habitat creation, seating, play, heritage interpretation, and community engagement. This is a city infrastructure asset that has huge opportunities to improve the resilience of the community, our city, and the Sydney landscape. With the right investment and collaborations, it can be truly multifunctional. I now hand over to Glenda to present our concept to you. Thanks, Lydia. Extending Sydney's cycling network and promoting a healthier lifestyle. Our concept proposes a seven kilometer safe, sorry, you might want to move on to the next slide. Yep, proposes a seven kilometer safe and inclusive active corridor that traverses through parklands along an open water course. A critical piece of infrastructure in the time of COVID which saw a significant uptake in cycling. Integrating blue and green infrastructure into our city landscape reduces the urban heat island effect and provides much needed cooling benefits particularly in central and western Sydney, which can experience temperatures of up to 10 degrees higher than the east. Reintroducing water and planting of diverse native vegetation provides critical habitat and encourages wildlife to move back into our cities and concrete jungles. The delight of waking up to sounds of birds and seeing possums, butterflies, frogs and ducks on your daily walk. Imagine a seven kilometre community garden of fresh fruit and vegetables for all, Extending through multiple neighbourhoods, it encourages community interaction, improves our relationship with healthy, nutritious food, whilst addressing issues around food security and resilience. Designing fun back into our cities. Equitable and accessible diverse playscapes for all ages, including us adults. This again promotes active and healthy lifestyles, fosters community and strengthens community resilience. As mentioned before, the corridor has a high heritage value, described as the Sydney Harbour Bridge of the water network. This concept presents the opportunity, sorry, you might want to move to the next slide. This concept presents the opportunity to celebrate the pipeline heritage and engage with local Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities in reimagining our underutilized spaces in our own backyards. I'll pass it over to Lydia now. Thanks, Linda. Can we have the next slide? Definitely different, different timing to 
the 20 seconds. Oh yeah, since, since winning the competition, we have been in early discussions with Sydney Water and have learned a little more about this asset. It was built in the 19th century and has considerable heritage value. It's listed in, on the Sydney Water's Heritage Conservation Register. And we also now understand that the pipeline is a critical part of Sydney water supply and that we will need to remain and it needs to be protected as a key part of the Sydney water supply. But through these early discussions, we are confident that the concept is still viable whilst continuing a safe and reliable operation of the pipeline. Together with Sydney water, we are interested in collaborating with government and private investors on ways to integrate this pipeline into the wider community. And maybe the next steps are also to investigate integrating other stormwater corridors into the design of the open spaces and landscape, potentially scaling up the idea of greening and redesigning stormwater corridors that are reaching end of life. And as Tom mentioned earlier in, in the Robert Day presentation, there's scope what's stopping us from connecting more widely and linking these reimagined stormwater assets into the wide blue and green infrastructure network to deliver these multiple benefits across Western Sydney. And to understand the full value of these initiatives, we should start collecting data now, collecting data on the asset as it exists, and then using this to benchmark the performance of the enhanced measures, whether it's improved air quality or increased tree canopy cover, or reduced temperatures, water quality. The opportunities to measure value are endless if we start planning now. And finally, because we want to maximize the benefits to the local community, we need buy-in from the local community. This means engaging with all communities, including Aboriginal communities, to hear your views and your needs. We can help facilitate the discussions, design and delivery, delivery, but we want these assets to feel like your assets and that you can cherish these now and for generations to come. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I've realised one of the slight quirks in all of this, of course, is that um, uh, it shows up on my screen just on time and then it's, it's clearly a couple of seconds delay before it shows up on your screen. So apologies about that. I think there was a, one, one of the joys of doing these things online. That was our last presentation. Thank you, guys. Look, there's, you know, this, this really speaks to a, a clear thread that runs through a bunch of these ideas around bringing nature back into the centre of our community, you know, that we have kind of um, urbanised all of our sort of open spaces and that some of them just, you know, the natural environment is far more... Um, is, is something that, that helps our mental health and our, and our livability and our lifestyle. So I really love this idea and connecting with those schools is a great one. Thanks. Um, that's, that's it. Look, just before we leave, I thought I might, it might be worth just giving a quick um, update for everybody as far as what happens next with the Public Space Ideas competition. Um, there are a bunch of different things that will be happening next. Um, as, as Alex Omar mentioned, $200,000 has been allocated in the, the recent New South Wales budget to undertake some of the works from the temporary and low-cost idea um, category. That's something that Placemaking New South Wales is leading on. That's not something that the, the committee is running on, but we're obviously delighted that people are picking up that, these ideas. We're advocating on all of the ideas that were submitted to the local local councils that, that um, are responsible for the areas that these ideas were placed in um, and we've been having an ongoing dialogue with government around that. The other thing I guess I would note is that um, in, in the next little while we're going to release a book with, with some of our favourite ideas or about a hundred of our favourite ideas because it's pretty hard to pick. Um, to give a kind of a, an, an inspiration bible for people around different ideas for taking um, the, the future of public space in Sydney. So look out for that. We will be in contact and um, all of our winners, of course, will be receiving a copy of that book um, because it is, it, you know, it's cracking ideas and, and the book is really wonderful. So uh, to everybody who's come along today, thank you for attending. Thank you to all of our presenters. Thanks for sticking with us with a slightly um, unusual, but I think pretty successful format for um, doing these sorts of things. Um, yeah, jump on board, everyone, everyone who's left over. So thank you for, for joining us. That was really, really wonderful to all of our winners. Again, congratulations. You know, all your ideas are so wonderful. And, uh, you know, you've gone above and beyond in, in, in taking the dive into a Pecha Kucha um, with, with only a week's notice. So congrats to everybody. You'll have to imagine all the applause from the audience. Well done. And uh, see you at the next event. See you all.